political writer of Crikey. His latest book is The Mess We're In, How Our Politics Went to Hell and Dragged Us With It. Please welcome Bernard Keane. <laughs> Hello, sir. Thank you. Welcome to the show. The mess we're in. Hasn't it always been thus? Hasn't politics always been a shitty, hellish, god-awful nightmare? Yeah, yeah, but uh, things have got a little bit worse in the last few years. Um, look, we've seen all, all the bad stuff that's been happening over the last few years. We've seen it before. We've seen the rise of fascism. Uh, we've certainly seen Pauline Hanson before. She's been around uh, uh, forever. Uh, we've seen political incompetence before, but there's a couple of things that make this fundamentally different. One is Donald Trump who's like a, like a J.G. Ballard novel come to life. Um, and the other thing is, along with all the bad political things that have been happening, um, we've had all these other really shocking and disruptive things happening in other areas, like the fact that our media is disappearing right before our eyes. Um, some cases, unfortunately, literally. Um, uh, and, you know, in a, in a democracy, the media is a fundamental, you know, check on power. And yes. when, when, when we've got a disappearing media, that's a, that's a key institution that props up democracy disappearing. So this is, a, this, is a, this is a pretty unprecedented time. Do you think that the cancellation of Snightly will be responsible for the rise of fascism in this country? Um, <laughs> look, I wouldn't have a direct link, but I'd say it's a pretty significant... It's a primary cause. I don't have a direct link. Necessary, but not sufficient. Well, here's a tweet from you. Let's have a look at this. This is something you put out there. I mean, there's been a lot of talk of fascism and Nazis and such of late, and uh, some accusations of hysteria around this. You tweeted, if you read histories of the 1930s and appalled so many people did nothing and think, yeah, I would have stood up against fascists. Well, you're in luck. Actual fascists are in our largest media company. Now's your chance. Uh, what did you mean by that? <laughs> um, well, I've, I've actually been reading a book about the 1930s. I've been reading a book written by Nicholas Whitlam, son of the, son of the great man, about 1936. And the fact that in Spain and in Germany, obviously Hitler was already in power, but all across Europe, fascism was on the rise. And you, think to your, you look back and you think to yourself, why didn't people do something more than, more than what they did. But if you're referencing their News Corp in this country, I'm sure lots of people who work for that company would say that is hysterical, that is an overreaction. Uh, yes, Blair Cottrell was booked on Sky News. Mm -hmm. That decision was immediately lambasted. Uh, they took off the interview, they pulled it away and that kind of stuff. Is not is that not a um, misrepresentation of, of, the, of the facts? Um, I think the, the, the mask has come off in political debate right across the world and it's coming off in Australia. I think we, we've seen a, a big slippage in standards in relatively quickly. I, I, I date it from, from the treatment Julia Gillard got back in when she was Prime Minister. The sort of abuse that was dished out to her, the, the misogynist abuse, really represented a big lowering of, of political debate in Australia. A lot of that was led by News Corp, uh, don't forget. But since then, things have snowballed. Uh, and it's not just News Corp's fault. Uh, you know, it's, it's got a no number of other causes. But, you know, the, the kind of... What we've lost in Australia, and I think what we've lost in so many Western countries, is a common set of values about what's right. You know, I think we all used to agree, you know, Nazis were bad. Well, now, <laughs> you know, now they're, now they're cropping up on Sky News. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's as though we've just collectively taken leave of our senses in terms of that sort of basic common frame of reference about, you know, that the, the, we kind of agree about what's important in the world. I look at what's happening in the US and the UK and I think, well, that's pretty, that's pretty scary. It feels like some scary shit going on there and it feels like things could change really quickly and get really dark really quickly in those countries. In Australia, it feels like just crippling stasis, like nothing really happens at all. And sometimes I'm like, oh, well, let's just let the left or the right win just so something will fucking happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, well, I, I feel like it's, it's, it's um, our political class and, like, the machinery is sort of so frozen that it's hard to see anything's getting violently good or violently bad. In, well, th in this, is the, this is the, this, the, one of the reasons why there's been such a disappointment with Malcolm Turnbull is that... He promised this sort of, you know, to use the dreaded phrase, and I'm, we're not talking about blockchain, but this, it's the blockchain phrase, game changer. He was supposed to be this sort of disruptive element that would put an end to this extended period of, you know, politics as this kind of uh, personality-based contest that never really seemed to deliver for people. And I think a lot of the... Malcolm Temple's really felt this big backlash because people invested such high hopes in him, almost unrealistic hopes, really, and he just he, he failed to deliver. That, that's, we're not talking there about Malcolm Turnbull's policies. What we're talking about is the sense of expectation that he was going to change things. He was going to break us out of, of, of that stasis. It just didn't happen. And, uh, look, you know, if Bill Shorten ends up winning the next election, I suspect he's not going to break us out of that stasis either. I think we're, we're going to be stuck with very, very similar policies. Admittedly, Labor's done some different things, but... Um, 
you know, we're talking about big economic and institutional drivers of that stasis, not, not you know, personalities that, that uh, you, know, you know, blow through the political system. Ah, uh, the personality of Bill Shorten. Uh, <laughs> They're still searching for it. They and... still look at um, <laughs> You diagnosed neoliberalism, the idea of neoliberalism as, as a cause of a lot of yep. our ills at the moment. Um, if people don't know, if I can just summarise it really badly, the idea that the government should be small, privatising things is good. Yep. Um, that's all good times. And, yeah, the government should be small as possible, let the free market decide a whole lot of uh, different things yep. and keep rolling along. Now, I mean, I would argue that, yes, the Labor Party at the moment is struggling to be an anti-neoliberalism party. Wh whichever way the next election goes, isn't neoliberalism going to be with us for, for the foreseeable Look, future? market economics is, and, and, and capitalism certainly is, and, you know, if you, if you get all the way to the end of the book, you'll, you'll see that I'm actually... I actually think that's not a bad outcome. But what politics in Australia has done in, in the last couple of years is really shifted to the left. And both sides have, have done that. So look at energy. Uh, in, in energy policy, in the 2016 election, Labor had this idea about a national interest test for uh, gas exports. And according to the coalition, this was some sort of outrageous Stalinist imposition on the economy. 12 months later, they'd gone way beyond that. They were advocating a, a, a national uh, reservation scheme for gas. So they'd leapfrog Labor in shifting to the left. Um, did I want on banks? Who ended up introducing a banking super profits tax? It was the coalition. Um, you know, again, leapfrogging Labor. Labor at the same time has moved significantly to the left as well. They're much more um, interventionist on industry policy, um, much more hostile to um, temporary workers. Uh, people coming in on 457 visas or what used to be called 457 visas, really responding to the community sense that, that, that immigration's got to be cut back when it leads to uh, impacts on wages. So, no, I think, I think both sides have moved to the left, but the government, the, the Liberals, are still pushing a lot of neoliberal policies. Company tax cuts is the biggest example. It's a, it's a policy that, that will literally do nothing that any of its advocates claim. Uh, what, we, what it will do is deliver enormous windfalls to shareholders. It won't deliver higher wages. It won't deliver additional uh, investment. Uh, it won't deliver additional economic growth. Um, but nonetheless, it's being pushed by the government because you know, they, they still believe in the basic idea that the more you look after corporations, the better off you're going to be. And, and what's happened in recent years has demonstrated that that's just not the case. Uh, I'm getting the wrap-up. We've only got a couple of seconds left. Can you let us know how we, how we fix it? <laughs> um, in everything. short, um, yeah. one big idea, radical transparency for government. So we, we, if, we, sh we need a new rule in politics that if there, unless there's a compelling reason not to know something about what a politician has done, including where they got money from, where they got donations from, who they met with, uh, what they're talking about in Cabinet, unless there's a compelling reason not to know, then voters should know about it. Give us a sense that the system's actually working for us uh, and we can trust the system, rather than the current perception, which is that uh, you know this system actually just works for the powerful and the vested interests. Is the fact that it's really boring a compelling reason to not share it with everybody else? Um, the, if we let boredom be the uh, the dominant issue in uh, how we approach politics, then you know we're going to leave it up to the very very boring to end up leading us. And uh, <laughs> look where that's led us so far. Yeah, that's worked out well. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for being here, Bernard. I appreciate it. Uh, the book is called The Mess We're In. It is out now. Please uh, thank you very much, Bernard Keane. Thank you very much. <laughs>